Today we're going to begin reading from, and yes, I know you've already heard this once this morning, but that's what makes it so important. But we're going to read again Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and 25. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. And as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message to his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. This is God's word for God's people. Thank you, Thank you God. May be seated. Are you all heading off to practice? No, you're in practice. You don't need practice. You're staying in it. Fair enough. Suit yourself. <laughs> there are no seatbelts. I'm warning you. How was your week? Great. Great, crazy, even nuttier as it get closer and closer and closer to Christmas because now there's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of traveling, there's a lot of things happening, right? So it's getting crazier and crazier. And I know that, that you're probably tired of hearing me say this, but. Um, I'm going to keep continuing to say it. Um, I hope and I pray that you make God a priority in the midst of your chaos. That somewhere in the midst of whatever it is that you were facing and going through, that God was somehow important. Important enough that you study something every day. That you pray every day. That you were looking for Him and that He found you and, and, and He talked and spoke to you. That, that he encouraged you, and you became his instrument, right? You not only then went and did something uh, in which you were able to see God work through you, but then somebody else was able to see God in you. And that's how this light of the world that Jesus is, is seen. Not because we quietly in our own little place read a piece of scripture, but that we take it out to the world so that it can be seen. Might be, unless our kids do it next week, this will be the last time you hear this. This is because 2020 is coming, it's right around the corner. Remember, do not be afraid. There is enough, and you are enough. Now we're on week four now, that it, right? So we started this four weeks ago, and, and four weeks ago we, we talked about watching for the light, right? There is a light that shines in darkness, it's only kind of us to be paying attention to look for it, right? And then the second week we talked about preparing for the light, not necessarily preparing things and stuff, but preparing ourselves. How are we, what are we going to do when we see the light? What, how are we going to respond to this light? And last week we talked about how we are the light. So in today's world, we are the light. We are what continues this light of Jesus that continues to shine is because of us. And now today, we find out what our source is. Right? The light. Christ himself is the light. In today's text, we see a side of the story that isn't often told. Right? We don't hear a lot about Joseph. We don't see a lot of him in, in Jesus' life. We don't, we don't read a lot about him except for in Matthew, right there, that we just read today. We find Joseph 
having trouble with accepting that Mary is telling him the truth, that, that, that the Holy Spirit is how she got pregnant, and this is how the Son of God is supposed to come, and he's struggling with this. He is an honorable man, so he doesn't want to make a spectacle, and he doesn't want to cause her any harm or her family, so he wants to do things quietly and this appropriately and without, without a lot of drama. Now, let's flip this story around to where our current culture is in today's society, it's in today's world. I can imagine Joseph, right, engaged to be married to Mary, and suddenly, knowing that they haven't had relations, knowing, she says, hey Joseph, guess what? This angel came to me, and I'm now pregnant by the Holy Spirit carrying the Son of God. There is not a lot of probably positive things that would happen next. Can you imagine that Facebook post? Seriously. Can you imagine how this would go over and play out? Right? Now Joseph's the bad guy because he's wanting to abandon his, his wife soon-to-be wife, right? Mary has to have been, you know, sleeping around with somebody else. This, this story would be constantly played out and constantly battered back and forth. And yet the part that we forget that about today's cultural society and this story, the part that's missing from now that they had then was a relationship with God. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute, because as you listen to every part of the story, something is very familiar and something happens very specifically to different people within the story. Mary, she's the first one that gets visited by the angel, right? The angel says, don't worry, don't be afraid, Mary, but you've been chosen to carry the Son of God. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. You will have a child. You'll name him Jesus. And then Joseph, in the middle of his crisis, he's about to divorce Mary and do it quietly because he's, he's not about the, the public display. And yet he's still, he's still conflicted in this, this decision of his. And an angel comes to him. And an angel comes to him and says, Joseph, don't be afraid. Mary is telling you the truth. This is how it has to be. So he says, okay, we got it. Now you, you fast forward a little bit to, to the birth of Jesus, and then what happens? The, the announcement of this, it does not go over the, the, the broadcast media of the world. No. Instead, there's these shepherds laying out in a field doing nothing but their job, which is watching the sheep, of which they're not highly thought of. These are the lowest of the low in their society. And an angel appears to them and says what? Don't be afraid. I bring you tidings of great joy, for the Savior of the world is born. You'll find him. If you want to go look for him, you'll find him laying in a manger. And so what do they do? They go. Why wouldn't you, right? A giant host of angels came and sang praises to God right in your face. I would go. Hey, let's go see him. Find out what these people are talking about. And then when they find everything exactly the way it was supposed to be, what do they do? They go share it with everybody, right? It's no different for us. It's no different for us. We have the ability to see this Jesus as our light of the world. I love that in every instance of those, this, this non-coincidence that I believe, um, when angels come, it's always bright and light, right? The glory of the Lord shone around them, I believe would be some verbiage that you hear. It's because Jesus was meant to bring light into darkness. <clears throat> he was meant 
meant to eradicate sin and death. That was his purpose. His purpose was to bring back the things that we've lost in our sinful nature, in that person that we are naturally to be. Thanks, Adam and Eve. But there was something about this, something about this situation in this night in which angels were able to come and bring peace and comfort to those that were involved. And now we sit here and we might say, well, I don't see any angels in my life. I don't see any bright, shiny things with wings flapping around, talking about don't be afraid. I don't hear that in my life. Well, what are you listening to? Who are you looking for? Because if we're not careful, the world will tell us exactly what we, they want us to hear. When we say, Jesus is the light of the world, what does that mean to you? What does that do for you? I hope that as you're pondering that right now, you find a place within your mind that are filled with things that can be found in Mary and Joseph and those shepherds when they found out the news, right? When they hear this news, each one of them is struggling with a darkness. Mary, come on, tell me that this 14 to 18 year old girl is prepared to be the bearer of the Son of God. That's a place that's going to be tough. Joseph, hey, uh, by the way, your, your soon-to-be wife is pregnant with the Son of God. Imagine what that does to a person. Or finding out beforehand, before the angel comes to, to help him, right? Now imagine the shepherds, oblivious to what's happening in the world because they've been cast out. They've been pushed away. They've been made less than. They were doing their job, shepherding sheep out in the fields. Maybe you're somewhere in this story today. Maybe you're somewhere in where you're thinking, man, I really despise Christmas this year. I don't have my family. I don't have this. I've got this broken relationship. I've got that that's falling apart. I just lost my job. I found out that, that the cancer's back. Whatever it is, this darkness that you're facing is meant to be eradicated by the light of the world. That's Jesus. And when we say that Jesus is our light of the world, we should understand that this Jesus is the light, the light that brings darkness to our souls, a, a, a light that brings us hope in place of despair, a light that brings us joy in place of sadness, a light that brings us peace in place of fear. That is what Jesus, light of the world, should mean to us. Too often, this time of year, or any time of year, we tend to place him on the back burner, right? We don't think about him as much, but in, around Christmas time, it gives us a chance to bring him. We dust off the nativity, right? And we set it out to be seen. We place these five <laughs> candles in such a way that we light them, and it's important, right? However, Jesus, this light of the world, it's not over on December 25th. This is something that's still at your access, at your disposal, 24-7, 365. His light is not diminished because December's over. His light does not suddenly appear because it's December 1st. No, this is forever. This time of year, we find it easier, don't we? We find that there, there's more Advent things and there's more studied things. There's more, uh, we, we find ourselves uh, praying more, right? Because we, we see it, we hear it more. Uh, we, we can turn on a radio station 
and find carols that actually see the name Jesus, right? It's so accessible and it's so easy. We find ourselves loving our neighbors more, don't we? We find ourselves giving to charitable places and things more. Because it's that time of year. Well, no one should be alone at Christmas. No one should be alone anytime. But it's easier now. Because it's our focus. It's our, it's our push. It's our drive. All of these things are the things that we should be doing all year long, assuming that we believe it when we say Jesus is our light of the world. I know it's not very Christmassy, but I believe that Paul described this, this light of the world, this Jesus. He described him best when he was writing to Titus. I know it's not when you read it all the time, is it? You don't read Titus that much. <laughs> Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. I want you to hear how Paul describes to Titus what Jesus is. If I can. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, light, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by this grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is the Jesus that we celebrate. This is the Jesus that is our light. This is the Jesus that makes us the light. This is our light, the Son of God. His earthly parents were a teenage mother and a man who had to muster up all the courage he had to help raise a son that's not his own. Because of this miracle of immaculate conception and birth, we get to become heirs and have a hope of eternal life. Wow. This, this is peace. This is already. This is completion of our souls. That's what our light is. That is what the light of the world looks like. You've heard over the last four weeks these four words. Hope, love, joy, and peace. Combine those all together every day for the next year. And you will find yourself in a beacon of light. And the world will see you. I pray that you will cling to him over the coming days. That you will not lose sight of the midst of gifts and flying wrapping paper, but that you will find him. Earnestly look for him. I'm asking you to pay attention and look for him. And when you find this light, truly find this light, it will change the way you see everything and possibly light the world around you. Amen.